You keep a good long hand, how about short hand? Not have much time. You belong in a circular file. There's nothing that makes you feel older than being reminded that the games you played as a kid are having their decade-long anniversaries. And recently, one such game that's reminded me that my biological clock is ticking is the original Shadow Warrior. Surprise! One of the games in the build engine, Holy Trinity, sharing that pedestal with Duke Nukem 3D and Blood. And regardless of which one you think is best, I mean, you can't deny that these three are the best the build engine ever got. <laughs> Since this bad boy's recently had its 25th anniversary, and also since we'll also be seeing the release of Shadow Warrior 3 hopefully in the near future, I thought it might be worth going back and taking a look at this thing one more time. Are you ready for that move? Back for Blood, Deathloop, and whatever new Call of Duty Activision pumps out of their creatively bankrupt ass is all still a ways off. So in the meantime, grab a sword, a couple of Uzis, and let's get some Wang. Want some Wang? One of the main reasons I think Shadow Warrior is still so playable is that the gameplay really hasn't aged all that much over the last couple of decades. There's been a recent rise in popularity with all of these retro throwback shooters, of which there's so many coming out that I'm almost considering hiring a personal assistant just to keep track of them. And because that style of gameplay has almost become commonplace again, something like Shadow Warrior has almost kind of aged in reverse and become the norm again compared to that genre of scripted, linear shooters with regenerating health, which now somehow feels more ancient and outdated than the games that preceded them. I feel like you can sum up the premise for all of those old build engine games in pretty much a single sentence. Duke Nukem 3D, Duke has to save the world from an alien invasion. Blood, Caleb rises from the grave to defeat a cult and an ancient god. Shadow Warrior, Lo Wang sets off to avenge his master and murder his old employer. And that's about it, man, that's all you need. Yeah, the premise for this one is that Lo Wang's a total badass that used to work for a super powerful businessman named Zilla. And for some reason, Zilla decides to try to kill Lo Wang after their business is concluded to, I don't know, cover his tracks or something. This is mostly explained in the manual, but also in the first line of dialogue you hear in the game. Zilla sins his regards. The only thing was that most people would probably kill this guy so quickly that they missed this line of dialogue completely. But that's all the incentive you need. From that point on, you pretty much kill every single thing that moves. Then what follows is a lengthy journey through some really cool and unique environments, all of which are a lot different to what we'd seen before. I mean, you got basic stuff like city streets, but then there's caves and mountaintops. You got spooky temples, which are actually kind of unsettling to navigate. Then there's industrial locations like factories and oil rigs. One of the final levels in the game is a giant tanker that's been intricately modeled, down to this place having living quarters, a kitchen, and bathrooms. And yeah, as was kind of standard for a lot of these 90s FPS games, the toilets in these bathrooms are often full of what I'm hoping is human shit. And I don't know if this was some kind of running gag between level designers, but it always seemed that 90s FPS toilets had to have some kind of floater in them by law. <laughs> you go boo boo. <laughs> the soundtrack also might be some of Lee Jackson's best work. There's not a whole lot of music in this one, but it does seem like the guy's gone for quality over quantity. And right from the opening level, the music just fits perfectly. Lo Wang was also a pretty unique character considering his build engine bros. I mean, you got Duke Nukem, right? The juiced up, ass kicking ladies man. Caleb is the stoic, morally ambiguous undead gunslinger, and then Lo Wang is kinda like the horny old peeping Tom, hanging around the ladies' locker room at the gym and trying to get a quick perv in. Hey, Chicky, you tighten my nuts, hmm? You're too short for me. How about you moon me? <laughs> I don't think my mother would approve. Come on. The voice work for this guy too is just hilarious, and I've always been impressed at how they managed to come up with so many random one-liners for him during combat. And they're often unique to whatever weapon you're using. Cut someone in half with the sword, and he'll say something completely different to what he'd say if they caught one of your sticky bombs with their torso. Oh, sprint personality. Sticky bomb, meet the missus. Who put these here? Ow! Outside of all of that, this is just good old-fashioned 90 shooting at its finest. The kind of stuff that'll make your palms sweaty, knees weak, and arms heavy. 
Despite Duke Nukem and Blood all coming out around roughly the same time period, it is also kind of amazing how these developers managed to make sure that there wasn't an overlap in the weapons across each title. And really the biggest strength for all of these three games was their arsenal. I like big weapons. When it comes to Shadow Warrior, what's also kind of interesting is that unlike, you know, every single other first person shooter ever made, your melee weapons weren't useless. In fact, they're actually kind of effective. <laughs> The fist, for instance, will finish off some of the basic enemies really quickly, even knocking them backwards. The sword's also going to finish off most enemies in a couple of hits, and with the basic ninjas, you even get this really unique animation of them getting sliced into pieces. Oh, look, you're coming apart! In a neat touch too, whenever you'd use the melee weapons, you could also be covered in blood, and jumping into nearby pools of water would even wash this stuff off. Gotta say, man, that this just blew my tiny mind at the time, and I remember thinking it was one of the coolest things I'd ever seen, aside from boobs and bottle rockets. <laughs> Filling out the rest of Lo Wang's arsenal, you've got shurikens. Yeah, I love the shuriken. Again, a weapon which was surprisingly effective. And arguably one of the better shotguns of all time with the right gun. Now, this thing could fire either a single shell at a time or four at once, which made it absolutely brutal at close range. <laughs> The way this thing would kick upwards with each shot is also awesome, and it's the stuff that boners are made of. Wouldn't be an Asian-inspired game without an Uzi, and in a pretty cool touch, you can also dual-wield these things. This is probably the weapon you're going to be using the most, also because it's the one that the enemies seem to use as well. Any good first-person shooter worth its salt has got a utilitarian automatic weapon like this, so Shadow War has definitely got that aspect covered. <laughs> From this point on though is when you're gonna see some serious shit, and a lot of these weapons are likely to hurt you as much as they are the enemies. As you'd kind of expect almost by like tradition at this point, the fifth weapon slot is where the rocket launcher goes, and this thing also comes with two alternate ammo types. You got heat seeking missiles, and then also the option to fire out a goddamn nuke. And I challenge anyone to find a fault in a weapon that lets you launch out small nuclear missiles. I dare you. The grenade launchers are another explosive weapons, but this thing is an outright liability. The reason I say that is because the splash damage range for this thing kind of feels like it's almost too far, meaning you're going to take splash damage from the explosions when you'd think you'd be out of range. As a result, it's a weapon that I just never really used all that much, and like the after effects of eating Taco Bell, when put into an enclosed space, the results can be deadly. It's also the same thing with the sticky bomb. Now, I do like the concept of this. Oh, oh, sticky bomb like you. You throw out this spiked ball that latches onto enemies and then explodes, but it just takes way too long before it blows up to be effective. Not to mention, it doesn't really do all that much damage either. The last few weapons, though, are awesome. Firstly, you've got the railgun, and I might be wrong here, but I do think this is one of, if not the first times a railgun was ever seen in a first-person shooter. Kawabunga. I mean, I know there was a railgun in Quake 2, but that's the first time I can remember seeing it aside from Shadow Warrior, which beat it to the punch, I think, by like a matter of months. The railgun fires out these super-powered shots that instantly jibs an enemy when they're killed, which is something that never stops being satisfying. Not to mention it makes this really soothing humming sound while it's equipped, which kind of makes the sound of a deadly purring kitten. In the second episode, you can even pick up the decapitated head of these guardian enemies and stick your fingers into the brain holes to cause this thing to shoot out different kinds of fireballs. And still, I don't think there's ever been any other game where you use a demon's head as a weapon and alternate between attack modes by finger fucking them. Then finally, you've got the Ripper Heart, because carrying around a decapitated head apparently wasn't enough. You may as well take a disembodied heart as well. This thing though is actually a bit of an underrated weapon that spawns in a low wing ghost, armed with a fast firing railgun that helps you out by killing nearby enemies. You have no honor. The only thing that I've never really bothered using all that much were all these ninja gadgets. Being a shadow warrior that comes with all the tricks of the trade like flash and gas bombs and cow traps. But I just could never put these things to that much good use. Who put these here? Ow! The only inventory item you really need anyway is the med kit because as you'd expect for a shooter from the 1990s, Shadow Warrior is a really tough game. <laughs> And I do think that it's probably the most challenging one out of all these other main build engine titles. In my opinion, Duke Nukem 3D is a pretty easy game for the most part, 
Blood, I think, is definitely harder, but that's only because of these one-off difficulty spikes in certain levels. Shadow Warrior, on the other hand, I think is just challenging right from the get-go, and it never really stops crushing the play's balls. Even though I've finished this thing more times than I've seen naked photos of your mum, I still go back to replay it and get a humble reminder of how unforgiving and relentless this whole thing can be. The biggest thing here though with Shadow Warrior, I think, is that compared to these other games, the deaths in this just often seem to come out of nowhere. A lot of the time in Duke and Blood, you can often tell what it was that actually killed you and identify where you went wrong. Whereas a lot of the time in Shadow Warrior, I just found myself dumbfounded as to what actually got me. Oh, damn it. Like this bit here, I have no idea what it is that killed me. And I've watched this clip a dozen times and I still can't figure out what it was. I compare this game to Quake in the way that enemies really waste no time in trying to kill you. It always felt that in Duke and Blood, you had like a buffer zone of like a couple of seconds before enemies would start attacking you. In Shadow Warrior though, enemies often seem to advance towards the player, and it's like they're aware of you before you are of them. Does that make sense? It's also not helping that some of these enemies are just complete pricks. Every build engine game has at least one really annoying enemy time. In Duke Nukem 3D, it's the sentry drones that chase after you and blow up. In Blood, I'd say it's maybe the hellhounds that can light you on fire. Shadow Warrior though has like half a dozen of these. The basic ninjas aren't annoying by themselves, it's just more the amount of them you often have to deal with. And the fact they've all got Uzis which makes them hit scanners. When you've got half a dozen of these guys shooting at you at once, I mean, just watch the way your health disappears. There's tougher variants that can launch out heat-seeking missiles, and one that's pretty much invisible. Able to shoot out fireballs that can kill you in pretty much a single hit. And because none of these guys have any concept of self-preservation, even outright killing themselves at times out of sheer boredom, it's not uncommon for them to use these attacks at point-blank range. Which can have you staring at that death screen before you've even realised you've been killed. The female ninjas are even worse. They'll fling out those sticky bombs at low wang without any hesitation whatsoever. Again, ending in a pretty quick restart and a nice slice of humble pie. I kill you. The rippers are those little gorilla looking things that hop around and attack you with their claws. And not only are these things kind of spongy, but they also let out this loud eardrum bursting scream every single time you hit them. Yeah, every single time. <laughs> Shut up, shut up, shut up! There's another weaker version of these guys called the Baby Rippers, which function the same, but thankfully don't scream like a pregnant yak. But instead, these assholes shoot fireballs. The Coolies are another interesting enemy type, and to be honest, I still can't decide if I love or hate these guys. These are enemies that walk around holding explosives over their head, and if you're unlucky enough to be close to them, they'll detonate it and kill themselves. But it doesn't stop there because there's a high chance that even when they're dead, they'll then turn into an evil spirit that flies around and phases in and out of visibility while launching pretty harmful projectiles. Kind of like when you ban someone from Discord, only for them to go and set up a fake account to come back and then keep sledging you. The only way to stop them from doing this is to blow them up so there's no corpse left. And the easiest way to do that is to finish them off with a rocket launcher. Or you can just stand over their corpse with the sword at the ready. Then you've got the most annoying ones of all time, the fucking Hornets. I mean, it's bad enough that Hornets are assholes in real life, now you've got to deal with them in a video game. If I had to put a list together for all the annoying enemies in first person shooters, well, I'd definitely put the fast head crabs from Half-Life 2 in there somewhere. I reckon also the Lost Souls from Doom, and then somewhere in between that would be these things. You only encounter them maybe four or five times in the entire game, which is the only positive to it, but it's just really tricky to hit them, and I think it'd actually be easier to shoot a hornet with a gun in real life sometimes. It's not all bad though, and I do have to say that I think the boss fights are kind of awesome. You've got a big fat sumo dude that's got weaponized farts, and then a serpent that looks like something out of Heretic. There's also really a lot to be said about the level design, because that's where a lot of this game's strengths I think still lie. A lot of these levels, I think, are still really detailed and have a great flow to them. One of the earliest levels in the game's got you trying to turn on the power, so you can turn on this machine and then use it to make a key to open a locked door. After the power's been turned back on, you then head back through all of these old areas. The lights have now come back on as well, making it look entirely different. 
There's a lot of times throughout all of these levels where you can destroy these weakened walls, which can then outright change the layout of the level entirely. This has always been one of the coolest aspects of the build engine, and that's the way that you can just shoot the shit out of the environment. And I really don't think that any game engine since has come close to making it feel so cathartic to shoot a giant hole through the wall with a rocket launcher. Shadow Warriors episode structures also kind of interesting. At the time, the standard for these games was that they'd usually be broken up into three episodes. The first one would be shareware, and then the other two would be included in the registered version. Shadow Warrior, though, had a bit of a different approach, right? Instead of being six or seven or eight levels, the so-called shareware episode was only four, and then the full version was another 22. The last two levels in the first episode, though, I think might be two of the best in the entire game, and it's a bit of a masterclass in Apex level design. Right, so these two levels include moving through Master Leap's temple, and then navigating the dark woods to hunt down the serpent boss. This starts off with you finding your way out of Leap's temple, which involves swimming, platforming, perving on anime titties, Whoops, low end drops up. You bend over, get it. and a lot of environmental destruction. But then it escalates to even more than that, where you've got to move around an active volcano, avoiding hornets and jumping over lava. For the Dark Woods, you start out in a dojo, then have to move through the forest for a bit, before then finding a little village where you even get to drive a tank. After that, you're suddenly riding a magic carpet through these caves. Hey, who flying this thing anyway? Where they've even managed to work in a Tomb Raider Easter egg. <laughs> She's raided her last tomb. Once you finally navigate through all of this, it's still a boss fight against the serpent, only this guy then ends up running away after you knock off half of his health points. Hey, come back here and finish fight! Ogre is Kelly, snake shit face. Which then leads into the second episode, where you have to finally hunt him down and finish him off for good. I mean, look, if all of this didn't get you amped up to buy and play that second episode, well then, nothing will. It's just such a really classic example of how the level design can seamlessly flow from one kind of environment to another, but also capture that feeling of the player actually making a tangible journey through the game world. And it really does start to highlight that point in the industry when shooters were starting to become more than just finding the red key card and finding that exit level button. Quake 2 and Half-Life would be out pretty soon, and from that point on, that singular map approach to level design would slowly become a thing of the past. I mean, even Blood 2 came out in 98 and adopted the same thing. That's unexpected! In a game that's already got some pretty solid level design, these two back-to-back -back are levels that definitely stand out, and they force the player to adapt and overcome to a whole heap of different obstacles. Ogre is Kelly, snake shit face. So, when you finally made it to that final fight against Zilla at the top of his secret volcano lair, you really felt like you'd made a pilgrimage to put this asshole out of his misery and avenge your fallen master. What have they done? Somehow fight against a heat-seeking missile launching mech samurai on a floor that's constantly shifting around is a bit of a cakewalk compared to the gauntlet that you've just had to go through. Black Chinese New Year Firework! As was pretty standard for the time, Shadow Warrior also got a couple of expansion packs, and these were called Twin Dragons and Wonton Destruction. Mm, what have we here? Twin Dragons was the first one, and it's a bit of a weird sequel where it turns out that Lo Wang's also got a long lost brother named Hung Lo. Yeah, Hung Lo, it's, I don't know, creative. <laughs> Now look, you can't really fling too much shit at this thing, considering it was given away for free back in the day, but then again, that's also kind of telling of its quality. I've just never thought that this expansion pack was all that good, and there's a couple of reasons for that. What have they done? I think for starters, the levels just kind of feel cramped and claustrophobic, making it really hard to stay mobile. The other thing is that they go way overboard on the traps in this game, which results in a lot of sudden deaths, forcing the player to kind of move really slowly so they don't get killed. There's no new weapons, and there's no new enemies, and they just use the same music tracks, and in some instances, it kind of feels like they've chosen the wrong music track for the level, in the sense that the melody doesn't really fit tonally with the mood of the level itself. It'd be like playing thrash metal in the reception area at a retirement home. I mean, it'd sound out of place, wouldn't it? It does have some neat level design here and there, but it really just feels like a fan-made spin-off, which is really what it is. <laughs> The other one, Wonton Destruction though, is definitely a whole lot better. There's still no new enemy types, but they have replaced the sprites for the basic ninjas and some of the other enemies. So, I don't know, at least some effort's been put into separating it from the base game. And yeah, the idle dialogue they've given these guys is also kind of interesting. 
And I don't think there's a single trap in the entire expansion pack. This is a positive change. I don't think my mother would approve. It still does suffer a bit from a lot of cramped interior locations, which again results in some pretty cheap deaths. Come again. Never mind. And I just don't get why they want to put you in these tiny ass rooms when you're up against enemies who launch explosives at you without any hesitation. There are some genuinely dope levels in this expansion though, like this one here on a fully modeled plane, which is really awesome. And then another one on a moving train. And if you know me, yeah, you know I love my train levels. There's even some creative lighting in some of the areas too, just reminding us how good this engine can look when it's put into the hands of creative people. The final fight is against Zilla, who's the central focus of the entire episode. And I do think it's kind of funny how Zilla's even got his own secretary. You belong in a circular file. Compared to the base game though, this fight against Zilla is just a bit of a joke. In the original game, the floor was moving around all the time, but now it's in a giant warehouse with a solid floor and a lot of cover. but it does have the best ending in the entire Shadow Warrior franchise to date. Because it turns out this whole time, Lo Wang's been stalked by some horny old lady that wants to jump his bones. Why does thinking about sex make me want to crap? I don't know, man. Considering every other woman he's interacted with has responded by shooting him in the face, I think he could do a lot worse. Surprise! Nothing much really happened with the series until Flying Wild Hog rebooted it in 2013 and turned it into like an arena shooter with a focus on spongy melee combat. The sequel, Shadow Warrior 2, instead felt like more of a looter shooter, set in a dystopic future with a weird tacked on co op mode. This time it still had a focus on melee combat, but felt a lot more receptive to using ranged weapons. Now with the upcoming Shadow Warrior 3, it's kind of like they're going for the Doom Eternal crowd, with an even higher amount of player mobility and heaps of gory executions and weaponry. Just like these guys can't really decide what kind of game they want to make, so they'll just cover all of the bases. If you want to go back and play the original though, which I do recommend because it is awesome, I'd say the best way to do it is with the Shadow Warrior Classic Redux Edition, which you can get on either good old games or Steam. This includes the full original game and both expansion packs. Not to mention, all you need to do is load the game up and then you can get right into it. There's no fiddling around with settings or any of that kind of shit. Bonsai! Still mostly fun to play in 2021 and it's a game that's always going to give you a good reaming. And you know what? At the end of the day, you can never have too much wang. Also, before I go, it's probably a good time to mention that I am now sponsored by Steel Series. These guys make some of the best gaming peripherals I've ever used with their keyboards, mouses, mouse pads, and headphones. And whether or not you're playing a game from 20 months ago or 20 years, you're still going to want the best possible gear to get the job done. So to get 12% off your next order, be sure to use the code GMAN at checkout. And speaking of checking out, thanks for watching. You are weak as a baby fart. Go live in fear. <laughs>